once again we praise the name of the living God for always uh, making it possible that uh, we share his word and uh, we learn of him he was of the meek spirit and lowly that uh, we may have the same attributes of our God and uh, <clears throat> our lives may be anchored uh, in him who has all the solutions to our problems and so i thank the lord as uh, we enter into the last presentation in this series uh minneapolis uh, 1888 it is uh, diagnosis analysis and uh, solution and so i like us uh, to pray and then uh, we can be able to continue with our, our presentation i like us to pray and then uh, be able to enter into this uh, last session that uh, we are having let us pray heavenly father again in your presence we are adoring your name for the gift of life and for the gift of the sabbath and so speak to us in the tenderness of uh, thy love and uh, father fill us with your spirit because that is the greatest need that we have at such a time as this in jesus name amen uh, in this world that uh, has full uh, is full of problems it is uh, a disservice to give people a diagnosis and analysis of uh, the issues at stake and then uh, not provide the solutions that they need for those problems and uh, in this uh, presentation in this uh, last presentation i'll be seeking to look at the solution of the matter after doing the diagnosis the analysis what you want to know to hear and to see is the solution to the problems that you are having and so i welcome us uh, again to be able to go through this as we look uh, at uh, the solutions we have uh, for the problem that um, we have uh, addressed the solutions that we have to the problems we have addressed and uh, i write go away and continue where we left and uh, i'll just continue with the message a little bit and then uh, i'll enter into the solutions and so were men free to depart from the Lord's requirements and could set up standards of duty for themselves, there would be a variety of standards set up to suit different minds. Men would feel competent to take the government out of the Lord's hands and act as gods themselves. The law of self will be exalted the will of men will be made supreme and the high and holy will of God and, uh, and the high and the holy will of God, his purpose of love toward his heritage will be dishonored and disrespected. When men feel free to choose their own way, they are in controversy with God. There is no place for gods in the heaven above God is the only true God. He fills all heaven. Those who now submit to his will shall see his face and his name will be in the foreheads of all who are pure and holy. We are looking uh, at uh, the solution now. This is the last presentation in the series, 1888. It is uh, diagnosis, analysis and solution. And we are looking at the solution now uh, to see what the Lord would want us to do. And so there's no place of gods in heaven and there's no place of gods in his church. 
God is the only true God, and men have to search their hearts and see if they are placing themselves to be gods or if they are submitting to the will of God. Continue on. We are looking at the solutions now. We are told, uh, I am asked concerning the law in Galatians, what law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ? I answer both the ceremonial and the moral code of ten commandments that uh, the the issue of the law in galatians does not only deal with the ceremonial uh, law but only also the moral code of uh, the ten commandments and this uh, points to jesus christ so that we may flee unto him for refuge and uh, be able to get redemption the law will not heal us, the law will not save us, but the law will point us to the solutions of the problem that we are having. And so as the law is preached, Jesus Christ should be magnified because he is the solution. Sin is the problem and Christ is the solution and the law points us to that solution. And if we continue preaching the law as it were with the brethren before 1888, then we are bound to be as dry as the hills of Gilboa. And so the law should have it its right place, Christ should have it its right place, and the sinner should have his rightful place. And so the main, uh, I read this and uh, I want us to see uh, what the prophet says, because the people could only think that the problem in 1888 was the law in Galatians. But uh, I read this in the beginning of the series, and uh, I want to repeat it as we go to the solution. Uh, J.S. Washburn was um, the son of uh, Sabbatarian Adventist pioneer Calvin Washburn, who had joined the Advent movement during the Millerite movement of the 1840s. Uh, as a... A youth day, S. Washburn had many opportunities to meet the founding pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Washburn claimed a rich heritage. He was converted by Jane Andrews at uh, 11, baptized by James White at 12, and began preaching at Venzim at 21. He worked in the Iowa Conference. It was from here that he came as a delegate to the 1888 General Conference session. The spiritual struggles that occurred at his meeting, at this meeting, left him groping about his own spiritual life, as even many were left groping for their spiritual life. A problem that later started, he later sorted through by counseling with Ellen White. Now you can say, how will we cancel with Ellen White? We have her materials and we can cancel with her through the materials. About this time, he, was also, he also began a correspondence with Mrs. White that lasted through the rest of her life until her death in 1915. Rejuvenated spiritually by the message of righteousness by faith, Washburn went as a missionary to England. Up until that time, the work in England had been struggling, but his creative tactics for drawing crowds and holding their attention literally changed the face of the church there from a small company of believers to literal hundreds who were converted at the time. There is a, uh, evidence that British Adventism may not have survived, but for his contribution as a powerful and creative uh, evangelist. In addition to his intense study of the spirit of prophecy and desire to obtain everything that is Sister White's wrote, Washburn's amazing memory enabled him to memorize much of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. We are looking at the problem and the solution. Uh, many think that it was just the law in Galatians that it was a problem, but there is something deeper than this. By 1918, that is Washburn, he claimed to have memorized Revelation, Romans, James, and Second Letter, Second Peter. Uh, he noted that uh, his memory improved with the study of the Bible and spirit of prophecy. By 1948, he claimed to have memorized the entire New Testament and was working toward committing Isaiah to memory. There is a most remarkable story regarding Washburn, 1888, and Ellen White, and this is the story that uh, I want us to see it, and then uh, we continue with the solution. Yes, Washburn, was, uh, who was a nephew of uh, George I. Butler, was 26 years old. In the year of 1888, the year when Brother Wagner and Jonas delivered to the Adventist Church, the 
special message of righteousness by faith. When he first heard the message, he rejected it because he felt that it was contrary to the established teachings of the Adventist Church concerning the law of God. Thus, he sided with Brother Uriah Smith and J.H. Morrison in their disavowal of the doctrine. It was during this time that he first realized that Sister White was in full agreement with Jonas and Wagoner. This knowledge led him to question Mrs. White's position as the Lord's special messenger. After a short time of struggle, he met with Sister White and his doubts were dissolved. He later recalled, uh, and uh, you better read this carefully or listen carefully with me. So I went, that is Jess Washburn, to have a visit with her in her tent at uh, the Ottawa meeting. I told her I had always thought and believed that she was a prophet. But I was disturbed by the Minneapolis episode. I had thought Uriah Smith and J.H. Morrison were right. Do you know why J.H. Morrison left the conference early? She asked me. I replied, yes. Then she told me just what Morrison had said to me and the revelation of her apparently superhuman knowledge of that private confidential conversation frightened me. I realized that uh, here was one who knew secrets. Sister White told me of her guide in Europe, who had stretched his hands out and said, there are mistakes being made on both sides of this in this controversy. Then she added that the law in Galatians is not the real issue of the conference. Now you, you, you start understanding the whole gist of the matter is the, not the law in Galatians, which actually preoccupied much of the conference session, brethren debating about this and debating that. By the way, brethren and sisters, we may think that uh, the doctrine we are debating are the real issue, but when God is looking at the analysis and the solution, diagnosis, analysis, and the solution of the problem, he says that that is not the real issue. And listen to what... Uh, Jess uh, Washburn has to say. Um, she said, there are mistakes being made on both sides on this controversy. Then she added that the law in Galatians is not the real issue of the conference. The real issue is righteousness by faith. And we have looked at the different facets of uh, the issue of justification by faith and uh, uh, righteousness by faith. And it's a cluster of uh, problem after problem. And uh, uh, I can say it's a cluster of uh, many topics that are misunderstood or the reactions to these topics, which is not the way Christ will react to them. She says, uh, the real issue is righteousness by faith. E.J. Wagner can teach righteousness by faith more clearly than I can, said Sister White. Why, Sister White, I said, do you mean to say that E.J. Wagner can teach it better than you can with all your experience? Sister White replied, yes, the Lord has given him special light on that question. I have been wanting to bring it out more clearly, but I could not have brought it out as clearly as he did. But when he brought it out at Minneapolis, I recognized it. And so here it is a prophetess bowing to humility, humility, uh, humility that uh, there are things that she doesn't understand even as a prophet, but another person can bring out the idea so well. This is the kind of the spirit we need in the condition of Laodicea, and if we will come, uh, Philadelphians, and if we will meet the stature and the full measure of the man Jesus Christ. Humility is something that uh, has been missing amongst us to accept others can be better than us. And as we are looking at the solutions, you understand, and I understand from my standpoint, that uh, the fruit of the Spirit has not been manifested in our lives. What is lacking is the full manifestation of the Spirit, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Continued on, as we look at the uh, solutions, I have not, I think, revealed the entire workings that led me here to Australia. Here, as uh, the people got tired of E.G. White, she was exiled in Australia uh, from 1891 to 1900. That is nine years, and uh, uh, I don't go. I won't go into this because I went 
through it when uh, I was presenting the history of uh, the church. You can look at it uh, at uh, our YouTube channel. And uh, she was sent to exile in Australia because the people were tired with uh, the messages. Perhaps you may never fully understand the matter. The Lord was not in our living America. He did not reveal that it was his will that I should leave Battle Creek. The Lord did not plan this, but he let you all move after your own imaginings. The Lord will have had W.C. White, his mother and her workers remain in America. We were needed at the heart of the work and had your spiritual and had your spiritual perception designed the true situation. You would never have consented to the movements made, but the Lord read the hearts of all. There was so great a willingness to have us live that the Lord permitted this thing to take place. Those who were wary of the testimonies born were left without the persons who, are, who bore them. Our separation from Battle Creek was to let men have their own will and way which they thought superior to the way of the Lord. So we find another problem is men thinking that their way is superior than the way of the Lord. And the solution to this is that we may become like babes and children so that the Lord may have his way in our lives. He may show us the true condition of our, our hearts and uh, we may accept when chastised and reproved by our Lord Jesus Christ. We are looking at the solutions to Minneapolis uh, Conference 1888. Humility um, and uh, accepting to be children which one can be corrected is one of the things. The solution as we continue, we are told the road to paradise is not one of self-exaltation, but of repentance, confession, humiliation, of faith and obedience. These are the things that we need as a people right now. The message to the Laodicean church is appropriate to the, to the church at this time. And so it means that the church drifted into Laodicean state, and this is what we need. Repentance, confession, humiliation, faith, and obedience. And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, This thing said the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I will thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou saith, I'm rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knoweth not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that uh, the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eyes love, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. There are many who are priding themselves upon their spiritual riches, their knowledge of the truth, and are living in guilt self-deception. So there is the aspect of us living in self-deception which has to be repented of. When the members of the church humble themselves before God by zealous, not half-hearted, lifeless action, the Lord will receive them. But he declares, I'll come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. How long shall this warning be resisted? How long shall it be slighted? The message of uh, Laodicea and has to be accepted by us as a people if we would receive the true remedy for that condition. There has been always a problem that the people will not accept their true condition of the heart. And Christ says that I have not come to call the healthy, but I have come to seek those who are, uh, to seek those who are sick. And unless we accept that all of us are sick and we need a doctor, then there is no need of a physician amongst us. But the moment we shall accept that we are sick of leprosy, leprosy, that sin, then we shall have the presence of the Lord amidst us working in a way that um, uh, it is marvelous uh, to the world. And uh, the remedy of our condition lies in the acceptance of our condition. But when we live in self-deception of our condition, then the remedy cannot be applied for a remedy cannot be applied where the condition has not been ascertained. Continued, she says that we thank the Lord 
with all the heart that uh, we have precious light to present before the people. And we rejoice that we have a message for this time which is present truth. The tidings that Christ is our righteousness has brought relief to many, many souls. And God says to his people, go forward. The message to the Laodicean church is applicable to our condition, which means that Laodicean lack Christ righteousness. How plainly is pictured the position of those who think they have all the truth, who take pride in their knowledge of the word of God, while it is sanctifying power has not been felt in their lives. The fervor of the love of God is wanting in their hearts, but it is this very fervor of love that makes God's people the light of the world. That is Philadelphian state. The true witness says of a cold, lifeless, Christ-like church, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I will thou what, cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Mark the following words. Because thou saith I'm rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knoweth not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Here is represented a people who pride themselves in the possession of spiritual knowledge and advantages. But uh, they have not responded to the unmerited blessings that God has bestowed upon them. They have been full of rebellion, ingratitude, and forgetfulness of God, and still he has dealt with them as a loving, forgiving father deals with the un ungrateful wayward son. They have resisted his grace, abused his privileges, slighted his opportunities, and have been satisfied to sink down in contentment, in a lamentable ingratitude, hollow formalism, and hypocritical insincerity. With pharisaic pride, they have vaunted themselves till it has been said of them, Thou saith, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. What uh, the church needs is to accept the opportunities that have been given to them by God, and respond to the unmerited blessings that God has bestowed upon them, and this will take them away from Laodicean condition. And uh, looking at the whole matter, there is nothing that Satan fears so much as the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church and an impenitent congregation. If Satan had his way, there will never be another awakening, great or small, to the end of time. But we are not ignorant of his devices. It is possible to resist his power. When the way is prepared for the Spirit of God, the blessing will come. And uh, how do we prepare the way of the Lord? It is by removing every rubbish from the way, uh, obstinate heart, impenitent spirit, and uh, stiff nakedness, so that uh, the Lord as um, a potter may take us in his hands as clay and mold us into his desired vessels to be used for his uh, holy work. It says, when the way is prepared for the Spirit of God, the blessing will come. Satan can no more hinder a shower of blessing from descending upon God's people than he can choose close the windows of heaven that rain cannot come upon the earth. Wicked men and devils cannot hinder the work of God or shut out his presence from the assemblies of his people. If they will, with subdued, contrite hearts, confess and put away their sins and in faith claim his promises. Every temptation, every opposing influence, whether open or secret, may be successfully resisted, not by might nor by, nor by power, but by the Spirit, save the Lord of hosts. And uh, one thing we have to realize also as the part of the solution to the problem we are having is that we are in the day of atonement. And so the prophet says we are in the, day, the great day of atonement when our sins are by confession and repentance to be go beforehand to judgment. God does not now accept a tame spiritless testimony from his ministers. Such a testimony will not be present truth. The message for this time must be met in due season to feed the church of God. But Satan has been seeking gradually to rob this message of its power that the people may not be prepared to stand in the day of the Lord. 
In 1844, our great high priest entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to begin the work of the investigative judgment. The cases of the righteous dead have been passing in review before God. When that work shall be completed, judgment is to be pronounced upon the living. Now, why is the understanding we are in the day of judgment a catalyst to uh, reception of the message of righteousness by faith? When you look at the prerequisites of uh, the people or the congregation or their duty during the day of atonement, you find that the people have to be gathered around the sanctuary and their prayers are sending high into heaven that uh, the high priest may not be slain, that their sins may be accepted, and the high priest may come from the holy, most holy place to bless the penitent congregation. But um, think about this. The people who should be gathered around the sanctuary, uh, their prayers ascending high to God in the most holy place, are uh, the same people who are scattered from the sanctuary, debating, envying, fighting one another, and having a spirit of contention, a spirit of strife, and uh, stiff nakedness of the heart. Such a state of aligning ourselves does not rightfully represent the people in the typical day of atonement, neither does it represent the duty of the congregation uh, during the day of atonement in anti-typical sin. And so let us go back and restudy uh, the day of atonement and the duty of the congregation. Once we do that and realize that the people had to afflict their soul, they have to offer an offering by, uh, they have to offer a sacrifice uh, of burnt offering. They had to do no survival work. You will realize that uh, much of the time is wasted by the people today in not gathering around the sanctuary and fulfilling the duty of the congregation during the Day of Atonement. Once we start realizing that uh, there is a duty we have to do, and gather around the sanctuary in an anti-typical way, then we shall be able to receive the message of righteousness by faith. Then Satan will not be able to hinder the blessing and the rain will fall and the loud cry shall be proclaimed in the four corners of the world and Christ shall be seen in the clouds of the air and he shall come to take to himself a church which is purified and having no spot. There will be messages born and those who have rejected the messages God has sent will hear most startling declarations. The Holy Spirit will invest the announcement with a sanctity and solemnity which will appear terrible in the ears of those who will not hear the pleadings of infinite love and who have not responded to the offers of pardon and forgiveness. Injured and insulted deity will speak proclaiming the sins that have been hidden as the priests and rulers full of indignation and terror, sought refuge in fight, flight at the cleansing of the temple. So will it be in the work for these last days. The woes that will be pronounced upon those who had light from heaven and did not heed it, they will feel, but they will have no power to act. This is represented in the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. They cannot obtain a character from the wise virgins and they have no oil of grace to discern the clear light or to accept it that uh, they may join the procession going into the marriage supper of the Lamb. So the condition spoken of the Laodicean church is the same condition spoken of uh, uh, the, 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 the foolish virgins, and uh, we should take heed of that. Um, and so the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. We cannot save ourselves by our works. So in this scripture, the Holy Spirit through the apostle is speaking especially of the moral law. The law reveals sin to us and causes us to feel our need of Christ and to flee unto him for pardon and peace by exercising repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. An unwillingness to yield our preconceived opinions and to accept this truth lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message through Brethren Wagona and Jonas. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. 
The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world, as the apostle proclaimed it after the day of Pentecost. The light that is to lighten the whole world with its glory was resisted, and by the action of our own brethren has been in a great degree kept away from the world. We can act as a, a hindrance to the light, or we can act as an acceptance of the light to those who are of the world. One thing that we continue asking ourselves, have we given our vessels, our whole body, our spirit to Christ, that we may be used as vessels of honor in uh, his uh, sanctuary? Again, we read, the matter in regard to centralizing all the power in one body in Battle Creek has become serious. From the light given me, I see that this administration is embracing altogether too much and is trying to carry burdens and interests which it has no strength or wisdom from heaven to bear or to conduct successfully. The Lord is just as willing to impart wisdom and ability to men in distant field as he to, is to impart wisdom and ability to the men in Battle Creek. The Church of Christ must depend on the source of all power for its efficiency. Christ is all and in all, the great sin which has been entering the ranks of Seventh-day Adventists is the sin of exalting man and placing him where God should be. This was demonstrated at Minneapolis. We are seeing the problem and the solution. The solution now is not to put men in place of God, and we must not centralize in one body, in one place, that uh, all our decision making shall come from one person or from a few individuals somewhere that will control the conscience of the people. There are few who will be pleased to meet the record of the transaction of that conference, how long and hard the battle was before men could be led to see that they were only men, finite erring men, and that God was dishonored by men making flesh their arm. And so, what is Christ doing as we speak right now? When Jesus began his public ministry, and we are looking at the Minneapolis conference, it is solution. When Jesus began his public ministry, he cleansed the temple from its sacrilegious profanation. Among the last acts of his ministry was the second cleansing of the temple. So, in the last work for the warning of the world, two distinct calls are made to the churches. The second angel's message is, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And in the loud cry of the third angel's message, a voice is heard from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not be partakers of her sins, and that you receive not, her, not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. We find that uh, the second angel's message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, is likened unto the first cleansing of the sanctuary when Christ uh, enters into the most holy place. Then uh, the third angel's message is likened unto the second cleansing of the sanctuary. I want us to recognize that what the Lord wants is us to cleanse our soul temples. He is cleansing the sanctuary, our soul temples, from every defilement. Once we realize that we are in the period when the second temple is being cleansed, we will know that Christ is about to finish his ministry. In the first cleansing of the sanctuary, Christ announced his beginning of the ministry here on earth. And in the second cleansing of the sanctuary on this earth, he signaled his ending of the work when he was on the earth. Now, in the giving of the second angel's message, it signaled the beginning of the work in the most holy place. And in the sounding of the third angel's message, it will signal the ending of the work. And now we can be part of those people who are being cleansed uh, uh, in this last act, in this second cleansing of the sanctuary, or we can continue in our own impenitent spirit, and then the Lord will uh, uh, pass us by, and those who will be ready will enter in in the marriage of uh, supper of the lamb, uh, uh, the, the bride and the bridegroom. And so we need to cleanse our soul temple from all defilement. Let me tell you, if your heart is in the work and you have faith in God, 
You need not to depend upon the sanction of any minister for, or any people. If you go right to work in the name of the Lord, in a humble way doing what you can to teach the truth, God will vindicate you. If the work had not been so restricted by an embedment here and an embedment there, and on the other side an embedment, embedment it will have gone forward in its majesty. It will have gone in weakness at first, but the God of heaven lives. The great overseer lives, the one who knew where Cornelius lived, and who appeared to him as an angel, and declared to him, your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. And now, do you send men for one Simon, whose surname is Peter, who lives with one Simon at Tana? And he told him the very place where Simon the Tana lived. Then the angel of the Lord went to Peter and prepared his mind for the reception of the men. And so, uh, the people of God, if uh, we will depend on God, he will himself speak to us directly where to go, to whom to go, and the work that we have to do. But because we are waiting for a multitude to be moved to do something, we lose the opportunities to be used by the Lord to do the last great work. If we are waiting, the whole church shall be revived and do this work, the whole movement, all these preachers we are looking unto, it will be too late for us to be involved in the great work of this end time. And so uh, some fear that uh, if I go, how will I get support? If I go, how will this and this be? And in, in as much as the Lord is uh, calling us into organization and gospel order, a message I preach and I love most, gospel order and organization, the Lord does uh, not... Uh, 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 reject our individual efforts to meet the people. And uh, by the way, I really want uh, the testimony of uh, Brother Tibeso when we were in the conference that uh, he's going and meeting people in different places. And although they have not been, uh, he has not organized as they should, but he's doing the more he can so that the message may reach to the people. And uh, I know the Lord will bless such uh, efforts that uh, we take personal ministry at hand and reach out to whom we shall reach, and then the Lord will organize these little companies into churches and uh, finish up his work. And so, don't be waiting for the sanction of anyone to go and do that which is the will of God. So, uh, the matters addressed were law in Galatians, place of law in righteousness, Revelation 13, 14, the covenants, the gospel order, medical missionary work. These were the things that were addressed and as we look at the last things, what is our greatest need? What is our greatest need? This is uh, what uh, uh, we have to ask ourselves in closing. The faith of Jesus, it is our greatest need. Mark that. But it is talked of but not understood. What constitutes the faith of Jesus that belongs to the third angel's message? And you understand the third angel's message is righteousness by faith, justification by, or by faith. Jesus becoming our sin bearer that he might become our sin pardoning savior. He was treated as we deserve to be treated. He came to our world and took our sins that we might take his righteousness. Faith in the ability of Christ to save us humbly and fully and entirely is the faith of Jesus. Amen. And this is what we need. To understand that uh, God can uh, uh, take away our filthiness and give us his own righteousness so that uh, we may be just like Jesus. The songwriter asks, what can take away all my sins? The leopard cannot cleanse his spots. Uh, and the, law, the writer of another song says that, uh, uh, I hear the Savior say that, uh, uh, that strength is indeed small. Child of weakness, pray, uh, watch and pray, find in thee all in all. And so our only power is found in Jesus Christ. That uh, he is the only one that can restore us into the image that we have lost. Not a church, not a person, and uh, cursed is a man that uh, put his trust in man. Jeremiah says that. What we need is the faith of Jesus Christ. And uh, the faith of Jesus Christ is believing that he can save us humbly, and give us victory over all cultivated uh, evil tendencies. 
What is justification by faith? Because we may be even talking about justification by faith and we don't understand what it is. And we may be looking at uh, the diagnosis, analysis, and solution, yet we don't know what we are speaking about. So what is justification by faith? It is the work of, of God in laying the glory of man in the dust. This is justification by faith. And doing for man that which is not in his power to do for himself, righteousness by faith. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Now, there are a lot of connotations, semantics, and definition. We even saw the quote where she says that, uh, why would we go into the controversy of uh, minutely defining the fine points of uh, justification and sanctification? This will not give the power to the message, but this will only bring in contention and confusion. But uh, uh, I suggest to you the simplest uh, uh, definition you can give to justification by faith is what inspiration gives. And uh, I'll just repeat it. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust. That is full stop. And the doing for man that which, is not, which it is not in his power to do for himself. And so... When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to cl be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. When they begin to praise and exalt God all the day long, then by beholding they are becoming changed into the same image. What is regeneration? It is revealing to man what is his own real nature, that in himself he is worthless. These lessons you have never learned, or that you could realize the value of the human soul and so unless we accept as the prophet says that we have never learned these lessons we shall not be taught but immediately we accept we have never learned about them then we shall be able to be taught and then you realize that uh, Deuteronomy 32 will be able to happen among us so quickly and uh, I'll write just to I like just to put this uh, on the screen uh, immediately he uh, says that we have not learned these lessons and so when we accept it he shall be able to teach us and uh, this is beautiful from Deuteronomy and when he teaches us what shall he be teaching us give ear all ye heavens and I will speak and hear O earth the words of my mouth my doctrine shall drop as the rain my speech shall distill as the dew as the small rain upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass. And so this teaching of Christ, after we have accepted that uh, we have not learned, and then he teaches us, actually his doctrine shall flow forth as the dew and the showers of the rain. How great a blessing we will have if we shall hear the message of uh, righteousness by faith from Christ and uh, take it in heart. Continued on that, um, and uh, I'm trying to forget uh, the verse. It says that uh, the Lord, the Lord shall send among us uh, uh, a teacher of uh, righteousness. The Lord will send a teacher of righteousness. It is an margin of. Uh, it should be the book of either Joel or the book of Hosea. Uh, I won't, uh, I can't uh, really uh, get it into my mind. But then, uh, if we accept we don't know, then we shall be taught. But if we presume uh, uh, the position that we are increased in goods, in riches, and we have need of nothing, then the teacher shall not be sent, and then we shall not hear the doctrine flowing from the lips of Jesus Christ as the deals. Uh, of the rain and uh, the latter rain itself. We are looking at the solutions. And uh, I have a couple of slides. Then we pray. Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, Behold your God. So the issue is beholding Christ. The issue is be continually beholding Christ and not a man. The last race of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world, is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The light of the Son of Righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth and deeds of uh, 
holiness. Appreciating the light. There must be no neglect of the grace represented by the former rain. Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. And so the issue is not having a theory of that light, but living a, a, a life, uh, living up to the light they have, uh, will make them receive greater light. Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of the active Christian virtue, virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. And uh, I can assure you that the deals of the latter rains are falling, and many are wondering what is happening, but uh, it is going to move into the uh, latter rain, and then people shall be left in darkness. Lastly, uh, what uh, a parting shot can I give unto you? I found that this is the greatest. Uh, uh, it may not be greatest to you, but it is greatest to me. As a man, he, Jesus Christ, supplicated the throne of God till his humanity was charged with a heavenly current that connected humanity with divinity. Receiving life from God, he imparted life to men. This is what we need to supplicate before the throne of God until our humanity is charged with the current of heaven. And then, as we are imparted life, we shall be able to impart life. And so, we shall be freely given and freely we shall impart. In fact, Christ says in the great day of the feast, that if anyone lacketh, let him come and drink of the water of life, and out of his bellies shall flow forth the rivers of life. And we want to be channels of light. We want to be rivers of life. We want to be like a spring um, in, in, a, in, a desert. We, in a desert. We want to be an oasis in the desert. Uh, we want our lives to be lives that um, can be a balm to the sick. We want our lives to be uh, a refreshing to those who have been walking in the wilderness of doubt. And so my prayer is that the Lord may do something anew in my life. The Lord may do something also new in our life, so in your life, so that uh, we may come together as a people and be able to have an upper room experience, and the, then the Lord outpour His Spirit upon us, so that um, we may be able to finish up the work. The Lord bless us as we as you contemplate upon these things, and uh, as we continue learning at His feet. Shall we pray? God of heaven, thank you, and uh, glory and honor be unto thy name. The diagnosis and analysis could have been so long, but uh, the solution so short. Yet we pray that uh, the few gems of truth that we are receiving may act as a sanctifying influence in our lives to prepare us to be used by thee. And so Christ, have your way. And uh, may you continue to increase as we decrease in our lives. This is my prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.